morning, Victory family. How's everyone doing this morning? Are you ready to worship? What we want to do is we want to just take a couple of minutes before we get into worship. And let's begin to just pray. This morning we reflect on Palm Sunday. This is the time where Jesus came into Jerusalem. And you know what amazes me is in his mind, the people are celebrating in their mind. They don't realize that they're about to give this man over to crucifixion. And so Jesus still mounted that donkey and came into the city because he was for saving souls. And this morning we celebrate what Jesus did for us. That even in our flesh, Jesus still put his eyes on the cross. And we celebrate Palm Sunday because it's about the cross, isn't it? Everything that we build our life on is about the cross. Jesus died for our sins. What you came in here with this morning, Jesus died for. And it's covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen? And that's something to celebrate. And next Sunday, we're going to come together and we're going to rejoice. We're going to worship at the celebration of Easter, of new life, where Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? So let's just begin to pray right now in our seats. We want to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to come in and take over this service. We need an encounter from Jesus this morning. Holy Spirit, move in this place, oh God. Fill this room with your presence, oh God. We thank you that you put your face to Jerusalem. You put your face towards the cross, and you still move towards it, oh God. Even though we as sinners rejected you, that nation rejected you, God. They rejected your peace, oh God. But you still went to the cross so that all would have an opportunity to surrender their lives. And Father, we pray right now for every circumstance, every sickness, every disease must bow at the name of Jesus. Everything we have done, all of our sin was nailed to the cross, oh God. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. Help us this morning to worship in freedom. Worship in a new freedom this morning, oh God. Break chains this morning. Break yokes this morning. Pull burdens down. We rebuke the enemy. He's not allowed in here. His box, his presence is not allowed in this place this morning. And so, Jesus, we lift your name high this morning. We worship you. We celebrate you, oh God. We praise your holy name. Anoint every family in this sanctuary right now, oh God. Open minds and hearts, oh God. Soften them this morning. Holy Spirit, move. We give you access this morning in your house, oh God. Let the wind of the Spirit flow through this place. We worship you, God. Move this morning, oh God. Move in our lives. Give us revelation this morning, oh God. We worship you. We worship you, King Jesus. We magnify you, King Jesus. Just begin to celebrate. Lift up your hands this morning. I lift up your hands this morning. Let's just begin. Continue to praise him this morning. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our praise. You are worthy, oh Jesus. You are worthy, oh God. We ascribe all praise to you this morning, oh God. We praise you, Jesus. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous can run in, and they are safe. We are protected under the name of Jesus. We praise you, God. Fill this place right now, oh God. Fill this place right now, oh God. We rebuke doubt. We rebuke that spirit of doubt, oh God. We pray that you would raise up a level of expectancy, God, that you're going to move this morning, oh God. We worship you. We praise your holy name. We praise your holy name. Let us see signs and wonders, oh God. We want to see miracles, God. We want to see healing, God. We want to see people healed in their physical bodies this morning, oh God. And we give you that access this morning to do what only you can do, oh God. We praise you, God. We worship you. We thank you. We want to invite you if you want to come up to these altars. Let's just storm heaven this morning. Let's just continue to praise and believe for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Oh, 
Remember those walls that we've all seen. 
this in one of the psalms. It's a psalm is basically a prayer put to music. Some of the songs we sing are like just prayers. Amen. Amen. And he said this, hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Preserve my life. Now this is David, the man of God. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. 
I think that the devil wants to use fear to discourage you. Wants to use fear to just cast you aside and make you hopeless. But you see, we have to believe this morning that his word is true. Not listen to our fears. Our fears will tell you it won't happen. Our fears will tell you it will never change. Our fears will tell us that we won't make it out in our, in our own strength. And, and this morning, I want to just encourage you. If you have a prayer request, would you just move out of your seat and just come around the front? We want to just go to God in prayer. Prayer is so powerful. Individually, individually, but it's more powerful corporately. There's something powerful about the people of God uniting in prayer, calling upon God. God's spirit dwells in the body of Christ this morning amongst the people of God today. Amen. Amen. Can we sing that one more time? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Before we lift up our voice in prayer, one more time, we're going to bless him. Come on, let this be the beginning of your faith being released. Come on, open your mouth. Come on, you got to put your faith on notice by declaring what you believe. Even if you don't feel it, we declare it this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His Suddenly, God, we pray for divine suddenlies. We pray for those 
impossible situations. In the name of Jesus, turn around. In the name of Jesus, be removed. We bless you this morning because you forgive all our iniquities. You heal all our diseases. You redeem our life from destruction. You crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. You renew our strength like the eagles. Lord, we thank you today. Lord, we praise you. God, touch every need represented in this place. Every heart crying out to you, God. Lord, it's for your glory. It's for your name's sake. Why should the heathen say? Why should the people say, where is their God? Lord God, it's your glory. It's your name that is at stake. We have proclaimed what you can do. We have believed what you can do. God, now we need to see it. We need to see the glory of God. We need to see the power of God manifested. So God, right now in every life, let our faith be quickened. God, let the miracle begin to be manifested. Let the glory of God begin to be revealed in every life, in every situation. God, give hope, give encouragement to your people that are believing you, God. Lord God, we thank you for the sustaining grace that you give us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that sustains us as we walk through the valley. Lord, you're going to bring this out to the other side. Lord, we believe it today. We declare it. We decree it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Take a moment to greet someone. Welcome them. Let them know that you are glad that they are in the house of God this morning. Good morning, Victory. We are in April. How many of you have a birthday in the month of April? Would you stand if you have a birthday? Where are all the April birthdays? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. May God bless you. We're not going to ask you how old you are. But we wish you a happy birthday. Amen. It's my daughter, daughter Hannah's birthday today. My grandson is here, so we'll pass on the happy birthday to Ezra. Amen. Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to be in the house of God? Come on, I truly believe that we are the people of God. And when we come together, the presence of the Lord manifests himself in a greater way because we are united. We're a family. Uh, we're in this together. There are so many one another's in Scripture. Yeah. And what I'd like to do is just to transition into a time of remembering the cross. You have by your seat, you have these emblems. If you would just begin to prepare them, sometimes they can be a little, little tricky uh, pulling them off. But we want to remember Jesus. Yeah. Yes. We want to remember what he has done. Yes. The same work of Calvary 2,000 years ago is still powerful yes. today. Yes. Jesus is still a savior. Yes. He's still a healer. Yes, he He's still a deliverer. Yes, he and he is still with us. Yes. And he himself, Jesus, the son of God, instructed his children, his, his church, his people, you and I, to remember. Yes. Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Why do we need to remember? Because we forget. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Isn't it so true? Uh, we can so quickly and so easily forget some things. And then we remember some other things very well that we should forget. Yeah. But this morning, I want you to understand that the perfect, holy Son of God took every sin, took every transgression, took all evil upon himself. It's unimaginable. It's, in, it's incomprehensible, really, to think that Jesus would bear our sins. God would allow his son to go through all of the suffering that you and I deserve. Aren't you glad that someone took your place? Oh, I thought you'd say a better amen than that. 
aren't you glad that your sins are covered yes. in the blood of Jesus? I don't think any of us would like all of our sins to be put up on the screen. Every evil deed we've done, every lie we've told, every thought we've thought that has been contrary to what is true and righteous. Thank God the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am not as holy as you think I am. I am not as spiritual as you think I am. Oh, it's only, it's only, only by the grace of God that I stand here, that you sit there. It's only by his grace that we have a hope this morning. But it's a powerful hope. This blood washes away our sin. His broken body makes us whole this morning. And we need to remember, we need to do this. Jesus said, or Paul writing in 1 Corinthians, he said, I received from the Lord the same, this same command. And he said, you need to, you need to remember yeah. regularly. We do it on the first Sunday of the month. We'll be doing it this Friday for Good Friday. Yeah. It's, you can never be reminded yeah. enough. Because yeah. we're bombarded by so many other messages that are contrary. But today we want to hear a clear word. Yeah. We want to hear a word that says... God loves us. Yes. And God forgives us. Yes. But turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to repent. You're going you're to turn away. God gives us grace to do that. Sin is powerful. Sin destroys lives. You don't need to be a theologian to uh, understand that or to, uh, a believer to believe it. You just need to know what the news tells us or what we hear and see. A world in chaos. A world that is going deep and deeper, but Jesus breaks the power of sin. Sin's powerful, but the blood's more powerful. Would you stand together with me and let's sing one more chorus before we partake. And I want you to be mindful this morning. I want you to just be uh, uh, examining your heart and saying, God, touch me today. God, forgive me. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't mean business with God. Amen? I, I trust that you're not just coming to church just as a ritual, but you're coming because you want to connect with God, and we can connect with God right now. So let's sing, let's prepare our hearts.
you would take this wafer that is just an emblem. Jesus took bread, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. This, this represents my body that is broken for you. Take and remember, let's partake. Jesus also took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood that will be shed for the sins of the world. You and I have the hope of eternal life. You and I have the hope of being forgiven because Jesus shed his precious blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What? can make me whole again. Nothing, Nothing but the blood. Amen. Amen. Let's remember, let's partake in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Would you grab a hold of the hand of the person next to you? Lord, we thank you for the church. Lord, we are imperfect in so many ways, but we thank you for the grace that is demonstrated to us and also through us. God, we thank you for the love that is shown, the prayers that are prayed, the concern that we have for one another. God, many times nobody knows the prayers that are prayed, even the, the, the love that is shown or the gifts that are given. Sometimes it's anonymous. But Lord, we know that the body of Christ is alive and well on planet Earth. We thank you for Victory Church. We thank you for everyone here. We thank you for every family represented. We remember those that are sick among us. We pray, Father, for healing. And we pray for wholeness. Those that are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray for the ministry of, of the comfort of the Holy Spirit through your people. God, we remember uh, Renee and Bill and... and his father and mother in the hospital God touch them today Father Lord every need every prayer request every burden we lift up to you and we thank you for the grace and the peace that is ours through Christ in Jesus name Amen you may be seated you may be seated Amen God bless you this morning you would just turn your attention to the screen just to hear our video announcements for the month Good morning, Victory family. We want to welcome you to another Sunday in the Lord's house. And we just want to take a few minutes to let you know some things that are coming up in the month of April. This Wednesday, there will be no life groups here at the church, which will mean there's no youth group, children's ministry, or nursery, because this week we will be reflecting on Good Friday. So we'll be having a Good Friday service this Friday, April 7th at 7 p.m. right here at the church. We want to encourage families to come out as we reflect on the cross, we're going to share some communion together, as well as do a candlelight service with a special video presentation that you're not going to want to miss. So we invite you to come out to be a part of that. It's going to be an amazing night. As you may know, Easter is only a week away. And so following the service today, we are going to be having a pre-Easter volunteer meeting. It's going to be brief, but it's in important that everyone who's going to be serving on Easter and anyone who serves in any capacity here at Victory to be a part of this meeting. We will meet following service right here in the youth sanctuary and we'll go over some important details in regards to Easter. So we'll see you there today after service.
<laughs> Is that what I know I ask this like every week. But would you like to ride to church with me? Oh, come on, man. Is that what you like my church? We have some hot music. It may not be what you're bumping. At all. But it's hot. We get down. What do you say, Mrs. Edwards? Oh, I suppose. I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted. And for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edward, do you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. super convenient for you to be able to invite people to the services on our Easter weekend, including Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We've created some really nice cards and have plenty available at the Welcome Center, so please take a stack with you, and throughout the week, just be praying for opportunities to invite people, whether they're in your family, at your workplaces, or places throughout the community. We do ask to make sure that these people you invite are currently not attending other churches. We want people to come and hear the gospel message to be saved delivered and to get connected and plugged in into what's happening here at Victory Church. So this week, be praying and we're super excited for Easter Sunday. We know God is going to move in a powerful way. The Women of Judah Conference is getting closer and today is the last day to register for that discounted rate for the conference. We have over 100 women already registered, so make sure that you get out there today to sign up. If you missed our video last week, here is a quick message from Jennifer Strickland, our guest speaker. She wants to share a little bit of what she's going to be speaking on that weekend. Hi, ladies. My name is Jennifer Strickland, and I'm going to be speaking this year at the Women of Judah Conference, May 5th and 6th. And I want to personally invite you to come and bring your daughters. We want the women and girls of all ages to come together this year for the conference. You know, girls are being bombarded right now with the images that they see in the media, with the lies coming through social media day in and day out. And it's time that the women of God gather together and really talk about how we teach them and learn for ourselves what it is to be a woman in this day, in this time in history, and what it is to use our voices to guide the younger daughters of God into their identity in Christ. You know, the media teaches girls that you are what people think of you, or you are what you see in the mirror, or you are how many likes you get on Instagram, right? The media teaches girls that their sexual and gender identity is their identity. But we know as the daughters of the king that our identity comes from who we are in God's eyes. And so that's what we're going to be talking about at the Women of Judah Conference, May 5th and 6th. And I cannot wait to get to meet you and to meet your daughters. So make sure to invite your neighbors, your sisters, your friends, and the younger girls. Let's all gather together and have a very special time of helping the girls and us, right, distinguish between the lies that we get from the media and the truths that we get from God's Word, because it is only in His Word that we discover what it means to be a woman and how to use our boys at this time in history. So don't miss it. I will see you there. If this is your first time here at Victory Church, we want to welcome you. You are our guests, and we are so honored that you took the time to be here this week. If you wouldn't mind filling out one of our connection cards, they're right in the seat pockets in front of you. 
Once you fill it all the way out, you can bring it to the Welcome Center, which is right in the foyer following service, and we have a really cool gift that we want to give to you. If you're tuning in to our live stream for the first time, we want to welcome you as well and encourage you to fill out a digital connection card right at our website at victorychurchri.com. These connection cards help us to pray with you, to answer any questions you have about the church, and to connect you with people. We have a free church app that helps you to connect into the life of Victory Church where you can give, sign up for groups, and register for events. You can download it right on our website at victorychurchri.com. You can also subscribe to our free sermon podcast, which will give you the audio of this sermon and all of the past sermons in the past in high audio quality. We do hope that you plug in, you stay connected, and we will see you after service in the youth main sanctuary for our free Easter volunteer meeting. God bless. things going on. Yes. Amen? Amen? Also this Saturday we have Love Beyond Measure and that's the ladies coming in from the community that we're going to bus in. Awesome. We have 25 already signed up that I know are coming, not including Woo! ones we have been inviting on the street. So we are excited. Yes. Ladies, come out. Blessings. Be part Amen. of that. We're doing manicures. We're giving out uh, lunch. We're giving out gift bags. We're doing use pocketbook, bags, and other things, perfumes and everything. So we're just going to love on them and bless them the day before Easter to just show them how special they really are. So before we take the offering, I just want to say we have a great opportunity this Easter, which is next week, to be praying about what God would have you to give for our mission offering because everything that is given for Easter offering that we take a special offering every year is for missions this year. And missions is dear to my heart because it's impacting lives near and far. And we just want to encourage you to be praying about that. Missions is the greatest investment that you can make on this side of eternity because you're touching lives, you're saving souls by your giving. And I just want to share a few other ways that your mission giving is helping and saving and ministering to people. I want to share a few things about our compassion outreach here at Victory. This is what we do monthly. We go out on the streets three times, a, twice a month, but one, once a month we bring them in. And that is Coffee on the Plaza where we serve yearly over 600 people for Coffee on the Plaza. Taking it to the streets, we serve over 600 again where we bring sandwiches and drinks and just love on the people, pray Praise for the God. people. And then our soup kitchen, our Victory Cafe, we serve over 500 people Praise a year. God. That's not including, so we serve over 2,000 people, including our annual cookout that we have a cookout for the community and the homeless, a harvest festival, and we also do Love Beyond Measure, which is next week, and our Christmas outreach. So yearly, we're serving over 2,000 people, and that budget comes to almost $5,000, and you know with the prices that are increasing, Probably more this year. So your mission giving yes. is impacting lives yes. in this community and the homeless in the city of Providence. Yes. You are impacting yes. lives. That's good. So that is part of what your giving is to missions. But another area is globally. And we want to see another video of one of the missionaries that we sponsor. And we have been sponsoring for many years. Hey, Victory Assembly of God, this is Judy Mitch, your missionary to the children of Europe, particularly the refugee children from Ukraine. I'm starting art and drama centers for them to help them through their trauma. I'm training workers in border countries and opening up these centers for them. Wanted to just tell you what's happening and thank you for your support. Love you from Spain.
can't all go on the mission field, but we can pray and we can give. Yes. And that is uh, a great opportunity next Sunday to give a special sacrificial offering. But before I pray, I just want to look at Exodus chapter 35, starting in verse 4. It says, And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded them, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. And then he went on to mention gold, silver, bronze, articles of uh, badges, scans, archaic wood, and all the above. But down in verse 21, it says, Then everyone came whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle. Amen. And that is our prayer for this yes. Easter offering, yes, that your hearts would be stirred and that you would come with a spirit that is willing to sacrificially give. It's not, it's equal sacrifice, not equal giving. But we want to be able to bless those people that are on the front lines, laying down their lives year after year, serving God in that capacity and even here reaching the city of providence that's what we're here for as victory church so today let's stand as we pray be praying about that offering for next week we're believing god for a great great increase in our missions offering that we can bless our missionaries all the more amen so father right now we thank you god for your faithfulness to us god we thank you for your awesome presence here today Father, we're thanking you, God, for just blessing us with so much, God, that we take for granted so many things. But this Easter offering, God, God, you laid down a life, your life for us, God, but you rose again, and we're going to celebrate next Sunday. And as we celebrate, God, we're going to bring an offering to bless you, God, and to bless your missionaries that are doing your work. So, God... We pray blessing upon everyone here today, God, as they give. I pray you continue to minister to them this week and show them, God, what you would have them to give in this Easter offering. So bless your people as they come forward today to give their tithes, offering, and mission giving. In Jesus' name, amen. You can come forward and there's four ways to give on the screen. says God is the glory and the lifter of our countenance. Amen. Amen. We're going to look into the word of God here at Victory Church. We lift up the name of Jesus and we honor the word of God. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And so it's important that we open up our heart and that we hear the word of God. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 23. I've entitled my message, Lessons from Another Cross. 
Lessons from another cross. There have been tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of books written about the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ is the most powerful symbol in all the world. But it's not just a symbol. It represents the greatest sacrifice that was ever made where the blessed and holy Son of God laid down his life for the sins of the world. In my personal library, I have probably dozens of books on the cross. Paul, the greatest theologian, was used by God to shape and uh, systematize the theology of the cross. And he said of the cross, as for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our boasting, our rejoicing, our celebration is not in our own achievements or our own attainments, but it's in the cross of Jesus Christ. We boast in that cross because we know what it represents. We know the power of the cross, not only uh, theologically or theoretically, but experientially. The change that takes place in our life is through the cross. And Paul, he boasted in the cross. Back then, the cross was an instrument of torture and an instrument of shame. So why did Paul glory in the cross? Because in it, the most selfless act ever performed by men or angels took place on it. Amen? He saw in the old rugged cross the hope of humanity, the end of sin's bondage. He saw in the cross the love of God revealed. One preacher said, a lone man dying on a cross did more to restore man's relationship with God than all the combined genius and power of earth's mightiest. But this morning, I want to give a little different twist, if you will. I want to look at the cross of Christ from a different angle. I want to actually view the cross from another cross. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 23. When Jesus was hung up on the cross, his feet nailed to the cross, his hands nailed, his side split open, his brow bleeding with a crown of thorns. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 23, chapter 23, verse 32, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. So Jesus, when he went to Calvary, there were two other criminals that went along with him and the Bible says in verse 33, when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, Jesus, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. This morning I want to talk to you about lessons from another cross. I want to read this passage of scripture. I just wanted to set it up for you to understand that when Jesus hung, bled, and died on Calvary. He wasn't the only one that was on that cross. There, were a, there was a criminal to the right, and there was a criminal to the left of him. And the Bible says in verse 39, that one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Now, as I read this scripture... 
I don't know if you've ever read it yourself. Or this might be the first time you're hearing it. I am so impressed by what I hear from this one criminal that was dying on the cross. I am so impressed by his knowledge. His theological understanding is really incredible. He had a solid grasp of biblical truth. I venture to say that if he were to give a lesson in theology or tell what he knows by what we hear in the scripture, he would probably know more about the cross than most Americans do. My question is this morning, where did he learn it from? How did he get such revelation? Because when you look at some of the things, some of the lessons I'm going to share with you, just a few lessons that we gain from this passage of scripture, it's, it's amazing the revelation he had. It's amazing the insight that he had. Where did he get it? How did he come across such knowledge, such revelation, such insight into spiritual matters? Had he been brought up in the church? Had he been brought up in a godly family? And, and then he turned away from the, the right path and ended up in sin and degradation and ended up on a cross? Or was he totally ignorant of the scriptures and understood them in the last few minutes of his life. The Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't explain that. All we get to go by is what is revealed in the word of God and what we see in these few scriptures. But again, the in incredible comprehension of biblical truth. I want to make note, if you are a Bible student, and I trust all of you are into the Word of God. I know all of us are into Facebook. I know all of us are into social media. I know some of us are into sports. I know some of us are into a lot of other things, but we, as the people of God, need to be in the Scriptures. Turn to the person next to you and say, you ought to be saying amen. But I want you to note in Mark's gospel, Matthew's gospel, that this man that I'm talking about, these lessons that I'm talking about from another cross, that this criminal also started out reviling and cursing Christ. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 44, even those robbers who were crucified with him reviled him. Mark 15, 32, and those who were crucified with him reviled him. So we have two criminals, one on each side of Jesus. Both of them are uh, dying for, for the punishment, of the, for their crimes, and, and they're reviling and cursing Jesus. They're saying, you know, if you're the Christ, come down from the cross, save yourself, and save us also. They were just looking to save their neck. They were just looking to get out of trouble. And I think all of us, when we get in a GM, when we have a problem, when we begin to suffer the consequences of bad choices, we just want out. Right. Lord, save me. We don't care how it's done or we don't, we don't care about uh, the steps to it. Or we, just, we just want out. But, but we're going to learn some lessons from, from this man, from this other thief on the cross. Uh, he, he was really a, a, a scholarly man, if you will. It's amazing how this man on the cross started out so bad, but he had a change of heart. This scripture literally fulfills a saying that we might say frequently. While there is breath, there is hope. Amen. While there is life, there is hope. Hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you and say, while there is breath, there is hope. Amen. Amen. We see in Luke chapter 23, verse 39, this man went from reviling Christ to actually revealing Christ. He went from cursing Christ to actually confessing Christ. This man, while he's on the cross, comes to his senses. He comes to his senses. 
What does it mean to come to your senses? It means to begin to think in a correct or sensible way after being foolish or wrong. In life, all of us need to come to our senses. Because we think foolishly, because of our sinful nature, we begin to, to get into thought patterns that can begin to lead us into habits, that can be bad habits, that can begin to leave us, lead us into bondage, that can begin to lead us into strongholds, that begin to slowly take our soul away, take our life away. And if you're living and breathing this morning, all of us have been vulnerable to sin because we live in a world of sin. We have a sinful nature, and it's by nature that we just sin. We like to sin because the Bible says in, there is pleasure in sin. But we've, we, the devil is a master at masquerading the effects of our sin, the consequences of our sin, what our sin leads to. But I thank God that Jesus hung, bled, and died on Calvary to forgive our sin and to deliver, deliver us from the power of sin. And that is so important. It's not enough that we're forgiven, but that we're delivered from the power yes. of our sin. How many of you know sin is powerful? And it's true. It's true. But here's this man on the cross suffering for the consequences of bad choices, receiving the due punishment Hanging on a cross, dying, but somehow, some way, he comes to his senses. He comes to a better frame of mind. The parable of the prodigal son tells us of a young man who turned away from the right path in life to one of sin, rebellion, and ungodliness. But then he sank so low, and he hit his rock bottom. He hit his rock bottom, and the scripture says he came to his senses. You know, sin is insanity. I said sin is insanity. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin is insanity. But, but the Bible says the prodigal son hit rock bottom and he came to his senses. There's a time in life where we come to our senses or we should come to our senses or we should seize that opportunity to change. You know, change is not easy. Fold your arms. Just fold your arms. I want you to, I'm telling you to fold your arms. Now, I want you to do the opposite. Fold them another way. You, some of you can't even do that, right? Because we're so used to the way we fold our arms. Try it, men, women, when you go home. Put your pants on with the other leg. You're going to fall. You're going to trip. I, I, I put my pin right leg on all the time. You try putting the opposite. Why? Because we're so conditioned to do things a certain way. We don't like change. We don't like change. We like to do things a certain way. And even when things are bad in our life, even when we are, are suffering or in pain or uh, um, being abused or being neglected or, or hurting or whatever, we, we, we stay the same because change is hard. Someone once said, you will not change until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Right. Let me say that again. You will not change until the pain of staying the way I am. Staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Change is painful, but, but, but when we start to hurt in a greater way, that becomes a motivation to change. Change. When we get a notice, when we get a report, when we hear something that puts us in that place uh, between a rock and a hard place, then we become forced to begin to change. And change is possible. Yes. Change is possible. We yes. see a bleeding, yes. dying man on a cross. Yes. And he comes to his senses. He gets, he has a, an aha moment. The light goes on. He gets a revelation. He gets some insight. And oh, how we need insight. How we need revelation. How we need our eyes open. How we need the Holy Spirit to help us to see the way things are. Truly, truly the way things are. 
we need that moment of clarity. We need the light to go on. And you see, that's the story of, of this cross. That's the lessons that we can learn. You see, we can learn something today that can make a difference. I said, you can learn something today that can make a difference. It did in his life. It did in his life. What a revolutionary change it made in this criminal's life. He woke up a criminal condemned to death. He fell asleep, a believer with eternal life. He woke up on his way to hell and he fell asleep on his way to heaven. He woke up with, with, with no future, without God. He fell asleep without, with an unending future with God. He woke up having made all the wrong decisions in life. He fell asleep having made the best and most important decision in life. That tells us there's hope for everyone. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. Hallelujah. Quickly, quickly, I want to give you a couple of lessons. I don't know how many I'm going to get through, but what, lesson number one. What does this man teach us? What is, what is the lesson from the cross, from the other cross? The fear of God. Look at verse 40. But the other answering rebuked him. The one criminal who... Started out reviling Christ and cursing Christ. Has a change of heart. Has a revelation. Has a, an aha moment. Has, a, has a, a coming to his senses. He rebukes the other criminal who's still cursing Jesus. He said to him in verse 40. He says, do you not even fear God? Do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation as this man. He grasps the important truth of fearing God. Fearing God. Do you know that there are some un unhealthy fears in life, but there are some healthy fears. You know, a healthy fear is being afraid of playing in traffic on 95 at 4.30 or 5 o'clock. That's a healthy fear. Not all fears are unhealthy. There are some healthy fears. There is a healthy fear of God. Yes. Now I understand maybe some of you, your upbringing, maybe at home, maybe in the church, you saw God as a fire-breathing, vengeful God who was always looking to get you. You step out of line, He wants to get you. He wants to, to, to judge you. He wants to cast you into hell. So maybe you grew up with, with, with some, some extreme view, a distorted picture of God. And what happens is we can rebel against that to create a God in our own liking. We can, we can say, well, I, God, my God is not like that. Oh, God is not like that. And we only see God as loving, merciful, and gracious, of which He is. Thank God. But there is another side of God. Right. He is a holy God. He's a righteous God and he must judge sin and you see that's what the cross is all about God judging our sin but making his son the bearer of that judgment what an exchange How, what a bailout you know we've had bailouts during the, the financial crisis in 2008 during COVID we got checks from the government it was like a bailout it was a help what a bailout the greatest bailout ever made was on the cross when Jesus took our punishment and exchanged and gave us his righteousness. Praise be the name of Jesus. Amen. But I, my Bible tells me in 2 Peter chapter 2, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and if God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example... To those who would afterward live ungodly. What is Peter saying? Peter, the apostle, 
under the revelation or under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is saying that, that God, he didn't spare the ancient world when they sinned. He didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. He gave them chances to repent. He gave them chances to turn around. God has been so patient with this yeah. nation. Yeah. God has been so patient with a nation that it's that is turned its back on God, cast God out of its schools, cast God out of its moral moral perspective, and has been so evil and so ungodly. Yes. You know, ungodly is simply living as if there is no God. It's living as if you are a law unto yourself and that, you know what, you can do what you want, say what you want, go what you want, be what you want, do anything, and there's no accountability. But there is a day of accountability. God is seen as a loving, merciful God. And even in judgment, understand something, even in judgment, his desire is that man would turn back to him. It's his last call. To a wayward people. Hebrews 10.31 says. It is a fearful thing. To fall into the hands. Of a living God. It is a fearful thing. Hebrews 12.28 says. Therefore since we are receiving a kingdom. Which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace. By which we may serve God acceptably. For, with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hello. Amen. 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 It is so critical. It is so critical to understand the fear of God. I've talked to people and I've, I've had people tell me, you know what? The, the, the fear of an eternity separated from God gets my attention. Yeah. Yeah. Jude, one of the writers of the New Testament, he said this. He said, of some Saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Some saved with fear. Not everybody comes by fear, but sometimes fear is a motivation. This criminal might never have come to salvation if he wasn't bleeding on a rugged cross himself. One scholar said... Conversion really happens on a soft, easy couch. Hello? Amen? It is so important that we understand the fear of God. What we have in a nation right now is no fear of God. I saw a video not too long ago of a transgender person. Hey, listen, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to be, it's okay. It's, it's between you and God. I'm not going to judge you, but, but you know what? You can't flaunt that in the face of God and expect God to be pleased with a nation that accepts everything and believe. God loves everyone, but his cross came to change us, to deliver us from every sin. Homosexual sin, lesbian sin, and heterosexual sin. God made man and one man and one woman, and, and, and sex was to be wholesome in a marriage covenant. But I saw a video of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a transgender person parading herself, months clapping and cheering right in the church, right up to an altar. And she wasn't wearing much clothes, or he wasn't wearing much clothes. Flaunting the vileness, the wickedness. That's just an extreme, extreme example. But we have been so conditioned to, to, to believe and accept everything and anything. Not realizing that there is such a thing as the fear of God. If we understood the fear of God, I think it would cause us to think of, uh, think about what we're thinking about. Or watch what we're speaking. Or begin to watch our actions. Because there will be a judgment day. Every single one of us will stand before a holy God. And unless we're covered by the blood of Jesus, there is no hope. How much? Do, how do I know God hates sin? Because I look at the cross. That's right. God hated sin so much that He judged it, but He loved us so much that He judged sin in His own Son. How shall we escape? Hebrews said, "If we neglect so great a 
salvation? How shall we escape? How shall we find another venue, another avenue and get away if we neglect the greatest sacrifice that was ever made? This man said, don't you fear God? There is a healthy fear of God. Just as there would be an unhealthy fear of God. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, By the fear of the Lord, man departs from evil. Hello? Amen. That's the word of God. Amen. By the fear of the Lord, man departs from evil. He say, hey, wait a minute. Uh-oh. I'm going to have to give an account. I'm going to have to stand and give an account one day. You know what? I'm sorry, but I won't be there to help you out. Your spouse won't be there to help you out. No one will be there. It'll be you and God. And you know what? On that screen... It's going to be all your sins. All your thoughts. I like to fool around and say, imagine if we had the technology, row 5, seat 3. Just put up all their thoughts right now. Even in church, some of what you're thinking. Even in church, some of you are still on your phone. Even in church, some of you are still thinking about other things. When the Holy Word of God is being preached, you're going to need this. You're going to need it. You can't go by your charisma. You can't go by your degrees. You can't go by inspiration and moments. It's got to be a heartfelt, consistent walk with God. Even when inspiration don't seem to be there. You will obey God. Proverbs chapters 1 through 7. They, they lay out this whole, whole understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. You see, judgment threatened is not to condemn us, but to save us, to warn us. We try to do that with our own children, don't we? Because we love them. We want them to avoid the consequences of their sin. We try to, to discipline them the best way we can. How much more a holy God. He loves us, does not want to see us. Go down paths and go down. You see, sin is so prevalent in our culture. Young people don't have a chance unless they stay close to Jesus. Amen. Sin's too powerful. Amen. Come on. Come on. The, 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 the sex, the, 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 the lust, the, the vileness. I cannot believe some of the commercials I see about the programs that are on TV now. Every vile practice that the scriptures condemn are now mainstream. God help us. You know what it says about Lot? When he was in Sodom and Gomorrah, he was a godly man, but because he was there so long, he became desensitized. He began to, 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 to linger too long when God wanted to deliver the people from Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what had to happen? He was telling Lot and his family was supposed to get out. They lingered. An angel had to grab them, grab them and say, come on, let's get out of here. Amen. Amen. In the midst of all that perversion, there are angels dragging you out of your sin. There are angels dragging you out of your confusion. You're not that holy. You're not that good. Neither am I. But the Holy Spirit is faithful. And God will assign angels to pull us out of destruction. If it had not been the Lord who was on my side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on my side, when men rose up against me, they would have destroyed me. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who delivers from all my destruction. Amen. Number two, and I'm going to close with this. i got too many points. But you're glad because you don't want my sermons to be pointless. <laughs> The first lesson from another cross is the fear of God. The second is like unto it, taking personal responsibility. Amen. Oh, this is a big one. Amen. Amen. Look what he says. Look what he says. I'm in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. I'm in the scriptures this morning. Look at verse 41. For we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. We Indeed, justly, we deserve what we've got coming. He understood that he was reaping the consequences of his own sin. The other one on the other cross, all he wanted was to get me saved. Get me off this cross. There's no remorse. 
There's no repentance. There's no anguish over sin. There's no understanding of, 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 con of, of conviction. He just wants to get saved. And a lot of times people even come to church. All they want to do is get saved. They just want all their problems to go away. Well, I'm not a magician. I'm not a Houdini. This steps. God will begin to deliver you. But you also have to walk out your salvation with fear That's and trouble. Right. You have to work it out and well, God works in you, and it's a process. If you if you live a certain way for 20, 30, 40 years and expect God to change everything tomorrow, that ain't going to happen. That's right. But God will begin to change you. God will begin to restore you. God will begin. Amen. He will do it. He is faithful to do it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But here he is. He understood. He understood that if he was going to get right, he had to take personal responsibility. God help us to admit when we're wrong. Yeah. Turn to the person next to you. Say, don't be defensive. Nobody's perfect. You know, I remember hearing a preacher one time, and it was so freeing to me. He said, basically, you've got nothing to prove to anybody, and you've got nothing to lose. Wow. Just, just be, be free. But we get so defensive. All of us get defensive. And I find even in the church, you can't tell anybody anything sometimes. Oh, Not this church, I'm talking about another church. <laughs> but the reality of it is, if we're going to continue to grow, to come to Jesus, you have to admit you're a sinner. Yeah. To be yeah. saved, you have to admit you're, being, you're drowning. Yeah. That's right. That's the first step. But it's also... Continual steps. We all have to continue to acknowledge, continue to admit that, that we make mistakes. That's part of sanctification. Amen. And then you receive grace. You know, sometimes we, we, don't, we don't see it, we don't understand it, especially in our culture. It's very hard to get people to admit they're wrong and take personal responsibility. We've, we've created a whole legal system. We've created even a whole theology that exonerates people and puts the blame on other people. Yeah. But we're all in need of God's grace. Yeah. We all need to say, Lord, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. And this man said, we indeed justly, we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. Well, you're saying, well, I'm not a thief on the cross. You know, uh, there was a pastor who was having a, a difficult time with a church member. Again, not in this church. But this church member didn't want to come to church. They didn't want to tithe. They didn't want to get involved in a ministry. And so they give him the preach, the pastor a hard time, and the pastor's trying to convince him. And so, so this person says, well, pastor, the thief on the cross, he didn't go to church. Wasn't he saved? Yes, he was. He didn't tithe. Was he saved? Yes. He didn't go and get involved in any ministries. Was he saved? Yes. So the man says to the pastor, what do you think about that? So the pastor thought for a moment and he said, you know, he said, the only difference between you and that other thief was he's a dying thief and you're a living one. <laughs> You see, he understood the justice of God. That's why when we have an altar call, when we have times of prayer, sometimes it's good just to kneel in the presence of God. Sometimes it's good to just focus on, on the Lord and to acknowledge that, that we need his grace. That's right. And taking personal responsibility is always a step in the right direction. Alcohol is anonymous. One of the steps is taking personal inventory. Right? Those steps are biblical and it's, it's evaluating and not blaming other people but saying, where am I wrong? And, and again, this man, what insight. Let me just close with one more. I'm going to just close with one more. The third, the third lesson, he understood the uniqueness of Christ. Look at verse 41. He says, this man has done nothing wrong. He knew that. He himself and his friend were not in the same class as Christ. 
They were ungodly. They were sinners. They were guilty. He was worthy. He was sinless. He was innocent. Hebrews 4.15 says that Christ was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He knew no sin. Christ is in a class all by himself. There's no religious leader, there's no prophet, there's no Mohammed, there's no Buddha, there's no king, there's no Old Testament great, there's no New Testament great. There is no one that is in the class of Jesus Christ. He is not one of the prophets, he is God in the flesh. He is sinless, he is holy, he is pure, he is undefiled. Hebrews chapter 7, this is good theology, I hope you're listening. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, who has become higher than the heavens. Amen. There are no skeletons in his closet. I'm going to close with this illustration, and I have one quick video I want to show. When I was, uh, I graduated from Zion Bible College, which is now North Point. And I took a year off and I served in my, my home church. And, and, and then uh, I went on for a fourth year Bible college. I went to a Bible college which, which was one of the happening places in, in America. Uh, a great Bible college. It went from 150 students to 1,500 students in four years. Some of the greatest faculty, some of the greatest buildings. I mean, it was a happening place. Thousands of people in the church. The school had uh, 1,500. I mean, it was, it was a happening place. The leader of that ministry had a moral failure. Mm. Got involved with prostitutes and alcohol and, and a lot of things. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was a tragedy. It was a great tragedy. He was once used mightily by God, impacting nations. He had crusades through Central America, 100,000 people. He was supporting missionaries around the world. Uh, just, just an amazing, amazing work that was being done. But um, he fell into moral failure, and, um, and 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 I remember being there. Now understand, we, we see even today some some pastors, some preachers, some denominational leaders failing in sin and, and, and doing the wrong thing and suffering the consequences of it. Uh, and it's it's difficult. It's difficult. But we always have to keep our eyes on Jesus. I remember trying to process all of that. Here I am in a Bible college that has the name of this individual. The Bible college is named his name. So, so here I am. I have a diploma. I remember calling up a few years later saying, can I get a new name for my diploma? Can you issue me a new diploma? Because they had changed the name of the Bible school, but they wouldn't do that. But anyway, I remember trying to process it. And I, we, this, this, this blew up during the week, had satellite uh, uh, news agencies all around the perimeter of the camp, campus, had, had helicopters flying over. I mean, it was, it was a circus. It was, it, was, it was crazy. And I remember, here I am in a Bible college of a man who, who became a public shame across the, the nation and around the world. And I remember on a Saturday having to go on a ministry that was part of the curriculum, and we had to go and share the gospel with people, and we were using the buses from the minute that the church, is, uh, that the church owned. And I remember being going, waking up that morning and saying, God, I, wanna, I don't want to be doing this. It's so embarrassing. It's, I'm so ashamed of what... What has happened and I have to go and tell people about Jesus and I'm driving in a bus that everybody sees the name of the church on. And you know the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I, I want you to get this because this is important. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, listen, you are not representing so-and-so. You are representing me. Amen. And that was a power. Uh, you got to understand, I'm in the throes of this. I'm in the middle of this as a 20-something-year-old trying to find my way. What do I do? Do I stay in school? Do I leave the school? How do I process? How do I deal with this? Someone I looked up to had this great moral failure. And you know what You know what else I felt the Lord say? You know, there might have been skeletons in his closet. But there's no skeletons in, in Jesus' closet. 
Amen. There's no bones. He rose from the dead. There's nothing to be ashamed. When you stand for Jesus, when you cling to Jesus, when you worship Jesus, you never have to be put to shame because there'll never be a scandal. There'll never be skeletons in his closet. There'll never be anything that'll make you ashamed because the Savior that we serve is awesome, he's mighty, and he's great. Can you play that clip for me? And we're going to close in prayer. The Bible says, my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. That simply means that you acknowledge that you need a Savior. You, you acknowledge you're a sinner. We're all sinners. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the mark. We acknowledge we're a sinner. We acknowledge we can't save ourselves because if we could, we would. If we could, we would. 
would have. Only Jesus is qualified to save us. Only he was perfect and holy. He lived the perfect and holy life. He died. He rose again to justify us, to forgive us our sins. We must admit, we must believe that. And then we must confess him as our Lord and Savior. And then we must decide to live for his glory. The Bible says we live for him who died for us. Why, why should we be excited about Jesus? Why should we give our all to Jesus? Why should we live for him? Because he died for us. There's no other cause worthy to live for, to really give ourselves for. There are a lot of good causes in this world, but none as great and as critical and as important as the cause of Jesus Christ. But you have to confess your sin. And if you're a Christian and you're living in sin, it could be sexual sin, it could be it could be any kind of uh, habit that is destructive, it could be anything. God's grace is sufficient. But you have to admit it like that man on the cross. He said, we, we deserve what we're getting. We, we, we're, we're sinners. He's holy. When you do that, God's grace comes to you. God, Jesus came with perfect grace and truth. A woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And the law of Moses said she should be stoned with stones. Her and him. But look at the religious bigotry or the, or the whatever you want to call it. They didn't bring the man. They just brought the woman right away. There's something wrong. But Jesus saw through it. And he said, he who's without sin, cast the first stone. They began to drop the stones. And only the woman stood there and Jesus said to her, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. There's no one here. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. There's his grace. There's his mercy. God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. No matter what sin you've committed. Look at this man dying on the cross. He was a robber. But, but most likely, uh, the, the, the Greek word speaks that he was a robber who killed people to get money. It wasn't just robbery. He was an armed robber. He was one who killed people. He was, a, he was a bad dude. But he was forgiven. This day you'll be with me in paradise, Jesus said. God is merciful. He'll forgive any sin. But Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. But he said, go and sin no more. See, there's the other side. There's the mercy and the grace, but there's the justice. You just... You don't get forgiven and just keep living your way because then that's not true repentance. Repentance is you turn away from sin to turn towards Jesus. You turn away what, from what's displeasing. How do you find that out? You find that out in the Bible. How do you know what's right and wrong? Not by culture, not by TV, not by what your friends say, but by what God's Word says. You learn about God, you learn about right and wrong from the book. This book we stand upon. This book we preach. And so this morning, I want to ask you if, if you if you need to come and you need to acknowledge some things before God, if you need God's grace this morning, and I know that's hard to do, and I know I know how church people can be, I know how people can be sometimes. They don't want to acknowledge that their pride will keep them in their seat, their pride will worry about what others are gonna say, their pride will feel like they're put on this. But you know what? When it get, comes to getting right with God, it doesn't matter. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the angels of heaven. I don't know about you, but I'd rather humble myself here than be humble there. So this morning, as they begin to sing, I want you to just move out of your seat. This is about getting right with God. Whether you're a Christian or this is your first time, you move out of your seat and you say, I want to. I want to learn some lessons. I want to I want to learn some lessons today. And as they begin to sing, it might be one, it might be two, it might be many. You just begin to come. Amen. Everyone bow their heads and let's pray right now. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the truth of God. Thank you, God, for the word is powerful. God, it's it's not emotionalism, it's not sensationalism, it's the truth. It's your word. It's the word that sets people free. It's not emotionalism. It's the word of God. And so God, today I pray that the word of God would touch people's hearts. I pray today that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will, will give someone a hope this morning. Like that, that dying man who woke up hopeless. But he had an encounter with the living God. He had an understanding.
Touch every heart right now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's begin to sing. Let's find a place to pray, a place to, to meditate, to contemplate what we've heard. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours and I will sing of your that brings about hope and change 
as it did for this man. Father God, I pray your blessing over everyone that has responded from their heart, Lord. God, that you would just do the work in their lives that would totally revolutionize them and bring them to a new place, God. God, we thank you today. We thank you for this day. We pray over our families. We pray over those that don't know you, God. We pray, oh Lord God, for our children, that they would come to revelation knowledge, that they would have their eyes open, God, that they would come to their senses, Lord, and they would see the right path, God, and they would follow you, Jesus. For there's no other hope, there's no other purpose in life. God, we thank you, Lord. Lord, God, we thank you, Lord, for the salvations. We thank you, Lord, for transformations. We thank you for what you're going to do today, what you're going to do next Sunday on Easter Sunday. God, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen.